Good morning, everyone. Uh, I don't I don't like doing too many announcements, but I, I do want to just let you know Miss Bev uh, Jackson fell yesterday and uh, fractured her hip. And uh, we haven't I've have not heard anything. Have you heard anything, Miss Naomi? Okay, she was. If they got her blood pressure under control, she's going to have surgery this morning uh, for it. Um, if they can't get her blood pressure under control, uh, she still needs the surgery, but they got to do that first. So please pray for Miss Bev. That's just not a um, not fun. So and thank the Lord, our teens uh, and all our all our folks came back from camp safely, had a good week. So praise the Lord for that. And then pay attention to your your list. All right. And again. Uh, Revival of Brother Davison, the 23rd through the 26th. We have several other churches that are going to be coming to visit uh, off and on through the week. Uh, so, and But you'll be in your place all day Sunday, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. So, amen. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you that you are such a good God, Lord, that you are high and lifted up. Lord, it would be hard for us to serve a God who is just like us. And instead you are holy and righteous and good and merciful and just, the epitome of love and the epitome of justice at the same time. Lord, I pray that you would accept our humble offerings, Lord, whether it be a time of worship or a time of praise, Lord, that we would offer up to you, to your holiness, Lord, and that you would receive the simple offerings that we would bring. And we thank you for it. Please help our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll go ahead and stand, grab your hymnal, turn to page 389. Page 389, we're going to sing, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Page 389 in your hymnal. Turn to page 170, page 170 in your hymnal, By the Gentle Waters, page 170.
let's do that last one more time. Jesus, loving shepherd, you will fit me never in your flock forever. I am not alone, though the darkness hides me. It's time for our tithes and offerings, Brother Craig, if you'd ask the blessing. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to sing just a couple of more songs. Stand and turn to page 540. 540, we're going to sing I Run to Christ. Page 500, 540. We're seeing the course before pastor comes. I love you, Lord, page 443, if you need the words. I love you, Lord, page 443. Oh, 
time in insurance you drop out. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, all oh, my soul rejoice, take joy, my King. He's listening. All right, Matthew 13. In Sunday school this morning, we reminded ourselves about worship that uh, in these services, you are not the audience. The audience is up there. I would be the director, and you would be the actors, and he's the audience, not I'm not the audience, you're not the audience, your neighbor's not the audience, he is. Amen. So, what are you going to do with your opportunity to worship the Lord today? Matthew 13, we're going to read verses 1 through 23. I'm going to do my best to read without any commentary. So, begin reading here. Matthew 13, sorry, I'll turn it on. There you go. Verse 1. <clears throat> The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Do you see that? Their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which is sown in his heart, this is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Notice the difference, just there's the only commentary. Verse 19, it doesn't say he received the seed, it says he hears it. But verse 20, he received the seed. Okay, verse 21. Yet hath he not rooted himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, 
which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Father, Lord, uh, we'd ask now that you'd receive, Lord, as we now offer our worship here in hearing your word, in our listening to what you would speak to us and choosing how we would yet respond. And we thank you for this. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm going to remind you a little bit of the message from last week. I'm not going to spend too much time. Um, but we're going to look at the wayside heart, the wayside heart this morning. So, but if we, if I want to go back over that we found that this is, this isn't a talk about an us and them stance by God choosing that some would hear and God choosing that some would not hear. As is quite clear, everyone heard the same parables, but the disciples, not just the 12, if you read through it, it's those that were even with the 12, they came to Jesus and said, we don't get it, explain it. Everyone had the opportunity to do that. But only some came and asked. And even Jesus, when he says, these people here fulfilling the, the prophecy of the prophet Isaiah, and he says, says, their eyes they have closed. And if we go back to the prophet of Isaiah, what he's quoting, he's talking about the rebellion of his own children Israel who have rebelled against God. And God is speaking, God is sending prophets, sending Isaiah and Jeremiah. I'm just thinking about those guys were basically told, here's your ministry, nobody's going to listen. Go have fun till you die. I mean, wouldn't that be a great ministry? That's the ministry they gave, knowing that they're going to preach and preach and preach and no one's basically going to listen. And here's the people of Israel, God saying, this is, this is these people. They will not listen. It's not that they cannot, they have chosen not to. Okay? And we, we looked at several different clues for that. The clue was, uh, number one, it, it's not a parable about the sower. It's a parable about the conditions of the soil. Does everybody remember? And then we looked at clue number two. The disciples didn't understand. They wanted to, and we've already mentioned that. Everyone had the opportunity. The only thing preventing from the multitude from understanding was from doing the same thing that the disciples did. Come and say, we didn't get it. Could you tell us some more? Instead, they walked away and said, great speech, great speech. And everyone went away with their own version of what that was. Not God's version, their version. Okay, that's called humanism, by the way. Clue number three it's the language of stewardship. The language in here is the language of stewardship. Talking about those that receive will get more. Those that, so you remember the talents? Those that had some talents and used the talents to make some more, they were given more responsibility. Those that did not use what was given to them, God took that away. Or the, 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 the master took that away. That's the same language being used here. The language is the language of stewardship. What's being done with the seed? Not from the sower's aspect, but from the soil's aspect. So that was clue number three. The language is the lang language of stewardship. The disciples are good stewards. The rest of the multitude was not. And clue number four was the illustration about Isaiah, which we're going to talk a little bit more about now and a little later. But Jesus is clearly saying this is not a sovereignty parable. It's a stewardship parable. It's a soil parable, not a, not a sower parable per se. This is all not about the sower. It's all about the condition of the soil where the sower is giving the seed, okay? It's the condition, like as we resolved again last week, it's the condition of the heart that receives or does not receive the Word of God as it is given. So, and it honestly appears because he says it is given to you to know and not them. He's comparing them as the different parts of soil. Essentially, Jesus is saying, I am the sower, this multitude is an example. I'm the sower. The multitude is the field, and I have sown. The whole multitude heard the same thing. The whole multitude. He is the sower. The multitude was the soil. Some of that caught the seed and went, I'm not sure quite what to do with this. Sower, <laughs> can you drive it a little deeper? Did you hear me? Some of them went back. Others went away and they said, good speech. Never, I mean, you know, that's the only thing they took from that is, wow, he's a really cool guy. He's a great prophet. What a great speaker. Okay? And we are going to talk today, and we're, we're going to separate this out a little bit. I don't know how far, but we're going to separate it out today. Today we're going to look at, because it's dividing into types of soil, we're going to look today at the wayside heart. The wayside heart. <coughs> and I, I wish, I, this is in my opinion, the most common heart in the world. 
amongst unbelievers and believers alike. The wayside heart, and I'm, you'll follow me all the way through, but this is the most common heart in the world. So what is the wayside? Okay, so if Jesus, where he was, uh, it's an agricultural community, and again we talked last week, we don't know for sure, but it could be quite possible that Jesus, from his ship, talking to that multitude on the shore, that there literally could have been on one of the nearby hillsides, which there were plenty of, a sower out sowing his field. It was the right time of year, it could have been possible, or there at the very least could have been a field in which every, every Israelite could have looked at it and they would have had the instant picture in their mind of watching their father or themselves with walking out in the field with the, that sack over their shoulder, depends on, how, you know, left-handed, right-handed, but, the, you know, run over the shoulder sack over here, and it would, he would reach into that sack full of seed, and he would broadcast the seed. And I've been told that that is quite an art form. It's not just, he's not just throwing it. There's an art form to making sure it's even, it's thick, and it's all where it's supposed to be. And the wayside is where he has tilled up his field, and how the fields are separated because on, a, on one hill might be several different people's field. And how they separated those fields would be where everybody walked. And they would walk. And often you could tell the difference between this person's field and that person's field by the trail, the walk path, the wayside. And we have the same thing today for heaven's sakes. A lot of times farm roads separate this field from that field. I, I remember hearing Ross Johnson talking about uh, oh, oh man, sorry, my brain just went to dusty crop hopper. Um, sorry, crop dusting. Some of you get the picture on that one. It's okay. He talked about flying a crop duster plane, and he talked about he would he would come down to spread the whatever it was he had in his plane, and he'd be on he'd be uh, flying over the field, and there'd be a little bump, you know, a little two track, a little farm a little farm track, and then there'd be another field. He didn't turn it off and turn it back on in the second that you get in between though, he just let it run and go right over both. Matter of fact, sometimes he talked about the heat off that road would make him drop down, <laughs> bounce off the road and keep going. No thanks, but okay. That, and that's the idea. When, when, when the sower is sowing, that, that hard packed area, and it does get very hard packed, he's gonna sow, he's gonna sow. It's not like when he gets up that he's gonna go, ooh, wow, I, you know, I, I gotta be really careful here. Absolutely not. He wants the best possible production out of every bit of field that he can get. So he's going to overcast, okay? He's going to overspread. Well, why would he do that? It's such a waste. No, he wants every, the loss that he gets out of the wayside heart is much, much returned many times over by that which even grows right up against that, that good soil right up against the wayside. So, you know, as you can imagine, every day the farmer walks his way to his field, and what is he doing? He's walking on the wayside. If he takes a donkey with him, if he has to take a horse, or maybe, I don't know if they had the single plow in those days, if he has to take a donkey out there, but there's animals and people and all sorts, maybe even shepherds on their way out to the, to the field having to walk over, and they walk over it every day, walk over it and over it and over it and over it, and then it rains a little bit, and then guess what? They come back and walk over it and over it and over it, and what happens to that, way, that wayside? Side. It gets hard, very compacted. <clears throat> my uh, my wife and I were just out. We went out to Mesa Falls, which, by the way, if you've never been there, you need to go. That's beautiful. But there is a trail between the upper and lower uh, falls at Mesa Falls, and uh, we're walking out on there. And I was noticing as I'm walking, like that trail is rock hard. I mean, it was really, really hard. At times, I'm going. Man, did they, did they pour this? And I got to looking. Just off the trail, they actually have signs up talking about watching for tracks. Literally, just off the trail, the, the dirt is so soft that if a moose went through a week ago, you could tell it. I mean, it just, there was tons. It was super soft. Anybody out there, you could see the passing of all sorts of stuff. But the trail, not so much. <laughs> you didn't want to trip and land face first on that trail. Not, it wouldn't be very much fun. And, and I think, too, uh, another thing I've been thinking about, because I've been filling up Thor's holes, slowly but surely getting my yard back over in that corner over there. It actually looks like, if you come over now, it actually looks like a pretty much like a yard again without grass, but it's starting to look that way. And, you know, he would, he would dig a hole, you know, because he's hot or because he needed something to do or... <clears throat> never mind. <clears throat> he's digging a hole. 
So maybe he's a dwarf, I don't know. So he digs a hole, and then he walks over and over and over and over and over. And so my, my process the last several weeks, spend about a half an hour, hour a day out there, just you know, loading up the wheel, wheelbarrow five or six times, and it doesn't look like I touched it. I can fill a wheelbarrow five or six times, overloaded, and look back and go, did I even hardly touch it? <laughs> my word. And I'd take the shovel and I'd go, <clears throat> oh, <laughs> yep, haul out the pick or the Maddox. And before I can use the shovel, I got to use the pick and the Maddox and tear it apart. I got to break it up before I can even move it. And then when I do move it, I get these big honking hard clumps, you know. I throw it in the wheelbarrow and it sounds like rocks hitting in there, clunk, 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 clunk. And then when I finally dump it in the place, I got to go back over and hammer down, I'll break up all this stuff. Why? Because he has packed hard by constant walking over and over and over and the ground got harder and harder and harder. And so the farmer sows. And to make sure that he gets every possible return out of this field that he has spent his time on, he sows and he sows liberally all the way up to the edge and beyond and some of that seed lands on the wayside. And of course, where he's tilled, the seed can land, and you know, if he's thrown it well, sometimes it'll sink just a little bit. If you've, ever, if you've ever thrown seed, you know sometimes it can sink a little bit, sometimes it just sits on top. But it doesn't take much, a little bit of wind, a little bit of water, some adjustment. Maybe he'll go back over, which he probably will, or go back over the ground and kind of turn the dirt over again to get it down just a little bit. That seed is eventually going to be in the ground. But over on the wayside heart, it doesn't receive the seed, the wayside soil. It sits on top. And you know, when seed's out and available, guess who shows up? Birds. I don't know, what in the world? It's kind of hard to talk when your nose is doing a... <clears throat> I guess the Lord needed some extra humor in this one, so... Because <clears throat> my nose is about to drive me nuts. <laughs> so, Jesus is talking about this soil. This soil. But he's not talking about soil. He's talking about hearts. So, the soil is too hard to receive the seed. There's too much traffic. Hardens the soil. The plow has not done its work there. Or maybe it's done its work, but the constant passing of, the, of people and travels and carts and animals has hardened it. And then, of course, the seed on the surface allows the birds to eat the seed before it settles in. Now, I'm not going to talk about the birds taking the seed. Not today. And I, I don't know if I will. I think it should be pretty obvious to you. Many of you have tried to give the gospel to someone at a time when they had... It's like trying to give the gospel to a guy who's just completely passed out drunk. That, that's pretty much wayside soil. He's very unlikely going to receive anything you've said. And the devil's going to come through with all sorts of other things and wander off. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Interest for a moment, gone the next. Now... I thought a lot about these different things. I thought about, well, obviously it's a heart that has too many other influences distracting it. And then I had this thought. Maybe some of you thought, well, you know, it must be that because the, you know, we like to carry these illustrations like way too far sometimes. It could be maybe the, you know, the sower hasn't been over there tilling that portion. And so the reason it's hard is because the sower hasn't been doing its work, which would be like us saying that the Holy Spirit is not doing his work. Does anybody want to make that argument? The Holy Spirit not working on hearts? Is that likely? No. And besides that, again, the parable is not about the sower. The parable is about the condition of the soil. And Jesus clearly connects in this parable that back to that prophecy in Isaiah, and he says in verse 15, this people's heart is wax gross. They have shut their eyes. And the passage back in Isaiah is very clearly the reason that the people of Israel are not hearing Isaiah's prophecy is not because Isaiah is not preaching. Isaiah is preaching. Isaiah is giving them the Word of God. They are getting it clearly every day and directly from God through the mouth of Isaiah to them and they're getting exactly this much. Is it God's fault they're getting that much? Is it Isaiah's fault they're getting that much? No, it's their fault. It's their heart that has been hardened. Hmm. 
the Holy Spirit has been working. The Word has been being preached, as it just was on this, on this hillside. The seed was sown, and while the hardened soil in a field can be blamed on external circumstances, the heart, listen to me very carefully, I need everyone to listen very carefully, the heart is not hardened by external circumstances. I'm going to say this again, and you need to hear this. Your heart is not hard because of your circumstances. It's not about what happened to you. The condition of the heart is the choice of the one who owns the heart. That's what Jesus is saying here. They have shut their eyes, lest they should see. The heart is hardened of its own choice. That's hard, isn't it? That's hard to hear. The heart is hardened because you have shut your eyes, I have shut my eyes to the truth that Jesus is continually offering. Instead, the word is offered, but instead, what do we choose? Constant interaction with external influences. You realize that the wayside heart is constantly being run over, okay? A heart chooses the influences that are given to it. Do you understand that right? Well, you don't understand my circumstances. Listen, there's horrible circumstances all over the world in every life. In every life, there are horrible circumstances. It's amazing how many people have faced the worst possible circumstances that a man could even think of and have come out the other with a wonderful, beautiful, golden, soft, responding heart. And others who have had, quote unquote, the greatest life they've ever, that anyone's ever known, soft and easy, and they have the hardest heart ever known. It's not about the circumstances. It's about how the seed was received. Everybody here? It is not that you have not heard the truth of Scripture. It's not that I have not heard the truth of Scripture. It's that we're doing nothing with it. I would speak to those who maybe look at these things in parables and may, maybe you're here and uh, you are not a believer. You'd consider yourself not a believer. And I don't know who that would be and I'm not, aiming, I'm not aiming at anyone in particular. If you're an unbeliever, it's aimed at you obviously. This is what we think. If you're someone who does not believe in Jesus, not as Jesus as the sole possibility of heaven and forgiveness of sins. If you're an unbeliever, if you have heard the gospel and are hearing it, or have read it, what you do with the gospel is going to determine your destiny. Not your past, not your goodness, not your badness, not what, what your parents did, not what your kids did, not what you thought you might do, what you wished for. What you do with Jesus on the cross is going to determine your detest destiny. What you do with the seed of the gospel will determine your destiny. In our passage, the Israelites, even those here in the multitude, were refusing to see and hear what Jesus was saying, that He came to save them from their sins, not their political opponents, not their physical oppressors. He came to save them from their sin. The greatest enemy in the world is not your circumstances. The greatest enemy in the world is not your oppressor. The greatest enemy in the world is not your political enemy. The greatest enemy in the world is your flesh and your sin. <coughs> The greatest enemy is not the one giving you a bad day today. It's the one that can give you a bad eternity. Your sin. Jesus did not die as a martyr, being a good example or a good person. Jesus died, and on top of the death of the cross, now, sometimes we focus on the death of the cross. Listen, be, let me be careful. Yes, the cross was awful, and yes, the cross was a great symbol. Jesus was not the only one to die in this fashion on the cross. It wasn't just the cross. It was the fact that what happened on the cross. The Bible says that He became sin for us who knew no sin. My sin, your sin, He took it on the cross as if He had committed it, and He took the punishment from God you understand that? He took the punishment from God 
for my sin, for your sin, for every man's sin. Punishment that we earned. Guilt that we, pay, that we had to pay. And he took that punishment and God accepted it. That's the most outstanding thing ever. How do we know God accepted it? Because Jesus rose again. If God had not accepted it, it would have been over right there. Jesus rose again from the dead and now extends his payment as a gift to all men. So if you're an unbeliever here, this is a simple acknowledgement. Jesus died on the cross and paid my sin. And I am no longer going to put my hope in my ability to do better. My only hope is Jesus. Amen. You must be willing. That, there's a willingness here. There's a willingness to walk away from all that you are and were. You don't have to become something new to get saved, but you have to be willing to be changed. <laughs> you have to be willing to, turn, to serve a new master. That's what repentance is. It's a change of the heart. You must be willing to leave your sin behind, selfishness behind. Believe in, believe in Christ and His payment for your sin. Amen. Amen. Not that you can do it, because you can't. But anyways, the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus paid for your sins on the cross, because you could not pay for them yourself. Repent from your own trying to, and accept Jesus' payment as already done. Amen. You can be saved. Believe. Believe in Jesus. But believers, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a little bit of my own heart in here also. <clears throat> I'm sure like me, you have found opportunities, or times, not opportunities, wrong word, if you have found occasions where you have been overwhelmed by your external influences, circumstances. And Jesus even talks about it when we get to the stony heart. We're not going to get there yet. But it's amazing to me how somebody can sit in their living room safely in Jerome, AC, heat, comfortable couch, police taking care of all the robbers on the streets, generally speaking, even stopping extra so people that shouldn't be stopped get stopped anyways. Ugh. They've got, probably have a gun or two in the closet. they got food in the fridge. Um, they don't have to worry about whether or not there's going to be a bomb dropped on the middle of Jerome. And they watch news and they go to bed scared to death about what's going on in the world. They allow external circumstances that have nothing to do with them. You hear me? Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely or hard or scary. Trust. Trust God. Or maybe it is true. Maybe. Can we just be honest here? It's the amount of traffic is the issue here. Because the sower also walks in the field, does he not? It's the amount of traffic. So what kind of traffic is it? You know, if, you, you know, if you're over there going, you know, I just wish God would speak to me. Why doesn't God ever speak to me? I just can't understand why God won't speak to me. God never, talk, God never talks to me anymore. I just never hear God's voice anymore. Just don't understand. Why. God doesn't speak to me anymore. That here, it's the amount of traffic. Do, there's, is there any distractions in this world? Uh, some of you, the, your distraction is none of those things. It's right here between your ears. What did they mean by that? Maybe they meant this by that. Well, maybe they meant that by that. Well, they could have meant that. That's probably is. I saw the look on their face. And then they had this gesture. So that probably is what they meant by that. What do they mean? Well, now I'm offended. I, was, I probably shouldn't be offended. Is anybody here? You, you know those conversations you have with people and you think it's all settled and then like three, four weeks, four years later you come back and you have a conversation and you're like, did you re -cash the, did you rethink that whole conversation? Because we were saying this and we agreed upon this when we left and now you're talking exactly the opposite. What's going on here? Some of you, your problem is right here between your ears. 
an overabundance in the influence of not the seed. Do you hear me? Not the seed. I mean, just to think of it really quickly, but when we plant seed, we just dump a little bit of miracle grow on it, and tomorrow we can come and harvest, right? But if we walk over a pathway for a, like a day, can you see it in the field? Walk over the same spot in a day, and tomorrow you come back and you'll see that track in the field. I, it's really cool having learned a little bit, but I love, I love tracking animals because they don't have to hit a, a spot too often where you can see that they've been through here. Grass is all pushed over. A little bit later, there'll be a little game trail through the woods because they use that same spot. It doesn't take long for that spot to show up. And we wonder, we look at God and we wonder, I just don't understand how come my heart, how come God never speaks to me? You realize seed has to be planted, has to be received, and then it takes time to germinate. I listened to Carlos. Some of you uh, remember Carlos Lopez, inter interned here a few years ago. Um, somebody interviewed him on a, a podcast about his barbering. He's doing a very good job uh, as a barber. John Ross is the reason he's a barber. And, uh, and uh, they were asking him some questions, and he said this, he said this thought, and it was, and now we understand it, but just the way he said it. He said, well, you know, what I'm, what I'm getting, what I'm benefiting from today is the work I did in the past. And what I'm going to benefit from in the future is the work I'm doing today. That's what sowing seed is. I sow the seed and I sow the seed. No, what does that mean, sow the seed? In my heart. It's being sown. It's being sown right now. I'm, I'm preaching the seed. When you have your devotions, you're, you're receiving the seed. If you have good Christian music playing, it talks about the Bible, good Bible doctrine truths, you're receiving the seed. What are you doing with it? Or do you spend all your life all day, got the radio on, not listening to preaching? You understand that that's a track run over and over and over and over. Well, there's nothing wrong about those songs, but it's not the seed. It's not the seed. Spent all my time. It's not the seed. Is there anything wrong with it? No, but it's not the seed. I understand why God's not speaking to me. Well, it's not about the seed. And it's not about whether or not it's being sown. It's about are we receiving it. Believers, here's the truth. It's not that the soil has not been tilled. The Holy Spirit's doing His job. It's that you've allowed fleshly influence and worldly influence to constantly run over your heart. And, listen, every time the seed is sown and it is not received, you understand you're hardening your heart. Think of our passage again. According to, according to Jesus, when He's quoting Isaiah, Isaiah is preaching to the hardened hearts of the children of Israel that are not listening. They hear the Word of God and it happened through the whole of Isaiah's ministry. And every time Isaiah preached and gave them the Word of God, and they ignored it, they were hardening their heart against the penetration of the seed. So by the time Isaiah died, some of them were going, wash our hands of that old fool. They did not listen. And he preached and they did not listen. And he preached and they did not listen. And he preached and they did not listen. And they preached and he or listen, maybe let me put it this way. He preached and they did not receive it. 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 Come on, stay with me. Every time the, the word is presented to us and we walk away without response, we have hardened our heart a little bit. Can I, can I put it this far? You're actually giving the devil access to your heart because when you harden your heart, who can show up? Every time you hear, can I just tell you something? Well, I just wasn't really affected by that message. That's impossible, by the way. That is impossible. How do you say that? Oh, well, let me see here. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please. There is, every time you hear the word of God, you have two responses. Two, that was nice, walk away. Or receive it. What do I need to do with this? 
Lord, I need a little more understanding on this. Lord, can you help me receive this? Every time, li li listen, if you don't think, I'm, this scares me the most of all. Some of, some of you have are only Sunday, Wednesday church members, and I, I mean just, I mean that's a good thing. Thank the Lord if you're a Sunday, Wednesday church member, hallelujah. I got to be a PK, EK, DK. If the door, church doors were open, we were there, and then we went into evangelism, and you're pretty much in church all the time. Four times, a, four times a day some services. Four preaching messages a day, sometimes more. And then conversations with pastors on the side. I mean, and times at the altar spent seeking the Lord and some other, another pastor coming up. Iris Salyers, I'll never forget Brother Iris Salyers coming up, putting his armor on me and giving me, a, giving me something to chew on that I had to walk away from going, what did he mean by that? I mean, just thinking, thinking. I'm the, all the messages I've heard and all that I'm going to be responsible for and all the times from the time I was a little boy hearing that and I walked out of a message where God tried to speak to me, and I was more interested in the girl on the other side of the church, or what I was going to have for lunch, or if I was going to get enough money from the guy I was talking to for a job to get my new engine from a car, or I want to go play basketball. You never, listen, you never leave the presence of the Word of God unchanged. You never you never leave the presence of the Word of God unchanged. Either you hear the Word of God and receive it, and it produces an eventual change in your life, or you hear the Word of God and don't receive it, and your heart is hardened. Every time. Whether you feel it, whether you see it, whether you see a massive change or don't see anything is irrelevant every time the Word of God is presented and you respond, you have produced a change in your life. So let me ask you a question. What are you doing with the Word of God? What are you doing with the Word of God? Every devotion time, every message, every time there's a, a song on there that has good Bible doctrine that, that hits you in the noggin, what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? Every time you sit in a church service and hear and walk out without a response, you're making a choice. I'm going to say that again. It doesn't matter who the preacher is. And I know I'm the pastor and it sounds convenient. It's just the truth. Every time you sit in a church service and hear the Word of God, by the way, that makes me more responsible because I studied it all week there and I preached it too. Every time you sit in a church service or preach in a church service and hear the Word of God and walk out without a response, you are making a choice to harden your heart to the things of God or to receive the things of God. You know what we need? Can I just tell you what we need? We need our soil tilled. And getting your toil sealed, toil sealed? There we go. <clears throat> getting your soil tilled, getting dirt turned over is massive. When God starts upsetting things in your life, maybe God's trying to till the soil. Things get all screwed up and you don't know what's going on. Maybe God is trying to till the soil. Why? Because He wants you to receive what He's trying to give you instead of harden your heart. There's a real simple practical application here. Here's the straight up one. What are you going to do with what you've heard this morning? What are you going to do? Because you're going to do something with it. You're going to accept it or you're going to reject it. Tomorrow morning you get up and you have your devos. How are you going to respond? You can choose to do it. Listen, you can choose all the excuses you want. You can choose all the external circumstances you want. But the ultimate thing is, the, is your heart, the condition of your heart, the response of your heart to the Word of God. And that is your choice and your choice alone. It's not the abilities of the preacher. It's not the abilities of the, of the Word of God. It's not the abilities of the Holy Spirit. It is the a condition of your own heart. Stand with me and turn to Hebrews chapter 3. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to read this as our clothing, as our closing. This is, gonna, this is a great day. <clears throat> Who knows what's going to happen tonight? <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 3, go down to verse 7. <clears throat> Hebrews 3, verse 7. 
Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my word, my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. <laughs> the people of God following the pillar of fire and the cloud by day, seeing the manna drop every morning, watching the, the rock split and water come out in the middle of the desert, watching birds just fall from the sky. <coughs> So they were knee deep in the camp. And they, what does he say? <coughs> they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. Verse 11, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. That which they have is taken away. Verse 12, take heed, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. <coughs> For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end while it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses... But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? Not that they didn't see it or hear it, but they chose not to believe it. So we see, verse 19, that they could not enter in because of unbelief. <coughs> Harden not your hearts. It's not about the sower. It's not about the seed. And honestly, even with a bad preacher, if he's trying to give the Word of God and he's talking about the Word of God, God can use it. If you're seeking God, God will use it. It's not about any of those things. What is it about? The condition of the heart that interacts with the precious, holy, miraculous, life-changing, powerful Word of God. It's not, the problem's not in here. The problem's in here. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Father, Lord, this is life has a lot of distractions, Father. The devil can be pretty convincing. There's times when we get captured by evil things and evil men and sometimes our own evil. And we allow that constant distraction to take away our ability to hear the Word of God. Lord, those circumstances, those events, those attacks of the devil and of the flesh they will always be present. They're never going to go away till heaven. But Father, if we would choose instead to just receive the word of God that is given to us, and maybe like the disciples, go and ask for a little more, we might find a life that can start producing things that we never dreamed possible. Not because we had control of the circumstances, but because we had control of how we received the Word of God. Lord, I pray for every heart in this room, Lord. There's hearts in here that desperately need you to do great works in their life. Lord, I pray that you'd help them to bow themselves humbly before a holy God. And receive the seed to think through the message, to think through the Word of God, to think through the passage and decide, what do I need to do with this? How can this make a change in my life? What is God trying to speak to me in my life with this? Father, please, soften our hearts. Help us to soften our hearts. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Piano's going to play. Brother Luke's going to begin to sing. Listen, how are you going to respond? You don't respond to me. You respond to God. You should respond. Amen. If you're not a believer, you're welcome to come. We will show you the Word of God about how you can have the sower active in your life. Amen. He wants to be. He loves you. you deal with the Lord. Amen. Brother Greg, why don't you close us in prayer?